Well, good afternoon, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And if you've joined for uh, the webinar, you're in the right place. We will be starting shortly. I can see the number of participants is ticking up. So let's give it another minute or two, and then we'll get started. Hi, uh, Peter, do you want to just try and uh, say something? If you can hear us. So if you've just joined, thanks very much. We're just going to start in a moment. I can see that the participants are still going up and we're just trying to get our last uh, speaker properly connected as well, but we will start in about 30 seconds. Martina and Maeve, I think it, it, it's, it seems that Peter isn't connected uh, properly yet. I think he might I think he might be in as a audience member rather than panelist so hopefully Martina can sort that um, and he'll get in as a panelist fantastic well I think we should uh, start in the meantime do you think so maybe yeah we'll, we'll kick off yeah great well thanks so much to everybody for joining I can see that we're we're up to about a hundred participants uh, already. This is a webinar entitled Green Mining uh, is a Myth, the Case for Cutting EU Resource Consumption, which is an event to launch uh, the brilliant new paper which is out today from colleagues at the European Environmental Bureau and uh, Friends of the Earth Europe. Uh, my name is Tim Gore and I uh, lead the Low Carbon Circular Economy Programme at the Institute for European Environmental Policy, IEEP, and this is an, an issue on which we at IEP are also uh, working uh, a lot. Critical question about how to bring uh, the EU economy back within planetary boundaries through reducing EU consumption of uh, raw materials. And uh, this is an issue which you know, can have uh, massive benefits uh, environmentally in terms of reduced pressure on biodiversity loss and of course, multiple benefits in the uh, transition to low carbon economies as well. Uh, but as we're going to hear today, there's also a huge social dimension to this question as well, and uh, really endemic uh, human rights, labour rights violations associated with the mining sector, uh, which uh, are a massive part of the uh, of the debate. And we're going to hear a lot more about that, um, including from rights holders in, in communities that are affected by mining projects here in Europe later. Um, uh, I would say as well that uh, this is a question which is growing uh, in importance across the EU institutions. We know that the European Parliament has been a vocal advocate for establishing uh, EU science-based binding material footprint reduction targets. Uh, that's important. We know that Eurostat is making real progress with establishing uh, the material footprint indicator and publishing that data, which is obviously a critical step towards uh, setting targets to reduce uh, the material footprint. So there's lots happening. And as I think as this, as this uh, report demonstrates, there is growing momentum and we hope that the EU can uh, uh, once again lead the world in establishing science-based uh, uh, reduction targets, not only for greenhouse gas emissions, but also for material footprints. 
Um, in terms of the agenda today, uh, we're going to hear in a moment from the Executive Director of Friends of the Earth Europe, uh, who's going to set the scene for us. Uh, then we are going to uh, have a presentation of uh, today's uh, uh, of the report, which has been launched today from uh, two of the authors, uh, Maeve and Diego. Um, and then we're going to have a panel debate. We've got three brilliant speakers for you uh, from the European Commission, from the European Parliament and from an affected uh, community. Um, and I'll introduce those when we get to uh, we get to that section. Uh, there'll then be a, a chance for you to ask questions of uh, any of the speakers. And in the meantime, you're very welcome to use the chat uh, function to introduce yourself. Um, tell us you know, where, where you're joining from, which uh, organization you represent. Uh, feel free to use the chat uh, to uh, share comments as well. If you want to raise questions, please use the Q&A function to do that. And we'll try and collate a few of the most interesting ones and uh, put those to the panelists uh, as well. And I understand you can also upvote the questions which you particularly want to get um, presented to the speakers. So keep an eye on the, on the questions as well. Uh, and I believe that we are using the hashtag green mining myth. So you can also uh, take the debate onto Twitter and share your thoughts there. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand uh, the screen over to uh, Jagoda Munich, who's the Executive Director of Friends of the Earth Europe to set the scene for us. Over to you, Jagoda. Thank you, team. A really nice introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Jagoda Munich. Um, I'll be speaking on behalf of Friends of the Earth Europe, and I'm glad to present uh, this report, Remining is Meat, the case of cutting EU resource consumption which we done together with European Environmental Bureau. And indeed, it's a crucial moment in time. Um, we know that we are facing multiple environmental and climate crises. Uh, on top of that, we had pandemic, and there's lots of discussion about how to build back better, what kind of social economic system we should have in the future. And it's hot political debate about it. We all, uh, since Commission launched the uh, European Green Deal, uh, that gathers environmental policies and initiatives currently be, being rolled out and implemented, there is more and more debate how we do this transition. And it, indeed, we agree that we need urgent, ambitious, socially fair transition as response to environmental climate crisis. Uh, the question is how? And we today want to open discussion on the blind spot of that transition, and that is overconsumption of resource and green growth that will lead to the green extractivism. So the aim of this report today is to open this debate on how to reduce material consumption as well as the overall consumption of energy. Rapidly rising global consumption rates in the past century have driven the extensive extraction of material resources. Globally, since 70s, the extraction of materials tripled. The EU itself is responsible for massive oil consumption with the material footprint approximately double the sustainable and just level. In the same time, the benefits and impacts of mining are unequally distributed. Globally, we have 1.2 billion poorest people currently account for just 1% of the world consumption, while the 1 billion richest account for 72%. Impacts of mining on local, mostly poorer, indigenous communities and nature are so devastating that whole communities vanish from the mining area at, at some places and living ecosystems are turned into dead zones. In the same time, those who oppose mining companies and, companies and projects are often threatened, displaced or even killed. Mining is the deadliest industry for those who oppose it. And indeed, if you visited any of those mines yourself, you will, you have witnessed uh, the impacts on the ground, which are really, truly devastating. The European Green Deal reflects this belief, uh, sorry, the, the EU to some extent recognized the impacts of industrial activity and the sustainable systems of production and consumption. But still we see that progress is measured by GDP and there is belief that it can be decoupled from resource consumption and environmental harms. While many of those, the measures that today the European Green Deal wants to implement are very often techno fixes. 
for example, real, reliance on energy and resource efficiency, initiatives for industry innovations, digital and low carbon technologies, and switching from fossil fuel vehicles to electric ones. Those are measures that are necessary steps in transition, but on one hand, they are not being introduced uh, with the required level of ambition. And on the other hand, they need to be complemented with the measures addressing the core issues of overconsumption and growth-based economic system. Under current growth model, it is expected that extraction of materials will continue to grow to meet demands for green and digital transitions. Greenwashing, greenwashing of mining is not solution and it's likely to meet a lot of local resistance from the impacted community. So this is what we expect to see in next years. The re this report zooms in on ma ma metals and ma ma metallic minerals and in particular those used for the twin green and digital transitions. Achieving EU emission reduction targets currently encompasses massive increases in the extraction of certain minerals, both in Europe and outside. So we want to look into that into more details. We want to bring the conversation about the need for the increase of Europe material consumption to be an integral part of EU attempts to reach a good life for all within the limits of the planet. And it is also a question of leadership, responsibility, and solidarity. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleagues to present the report in more details. I'm looking forward for interesting discussion today and to your questions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jagra, and hi, everyone. Thank you for that great introduction. My name is Maeve. I work with Friends of the Earth Europe, and I'm one of the report authors. I'm really happy that everyone, yeah, we've got lots of people here today. It's brilliant to have this important discussion. Um, and again, yeah, I encourage you throughout our presentation to ask questions in the Q&A and you can vote up um, other people's questions as well. So I'm gonna share my screen and we'll give a presentation. So Diego from the EEB, another one of the report authors and I will give a brief presentation. The report is expansive. If you've had a read of it or a look through it already, you'll know that it touched on many elements related to this issue. So we'll touch on some of the key ones today um, and I encourage you to have a read of the report afterwards. Um, I'll talk a little bit first about some facts and figures around EU and global material and metals and minerals consumption. Diego will then talk a bit about the environmental and human rights impacts of mining and issues affected communities face. And finally, we'll look a little bit at the EU policy context and our policy and other recommendations. So firstly, putting it all into a bit of context, looking at EU overconsumption. Jagoda gave a short account of global consumption rates. Now to look more at the EU, the EU material footprint as measured by Eurostat is 14 and a half tons per capita. So the material footprint measures the total mass of raw materials, biomass, fossil fuels, metals and non-metallic minerals that are extracted along entire supply chains in order to produce the final products and services consumed in a certain country or region. So in the EU extraction for final EU consumption and its environmental and social impacts outside of the EU are taken into consideration. It's also a good proxy of overall environmental damage caused by final consumption. Um, the EU's material footprint, as you can see, is about double what's considered a sustainable and just level, which best available research at the moment says is between about five and ton, 10 tonnes per capita to be within limits. Um, it had been rising for decades and dropped, you can see in the aftermath of the 2008 economic crisis, and ever since has remained relatively stable. But this, this stable consumption is in spite of increasing industry and political rhetoric on an action on greening the economy and implementing circular economy policies. Um, now looking a bit at the projections. So the main projections come from the UN uh, International Resources Panel and the OECD. They've both done research to look at projected overall material demand. So these projections are following historical trends 
current patterns of production and consumption and excluding consequences of potential policy changes. So if we look on this path, we can see that project, they project global material use will more than double by 2060, an increase of between 45 and 55 percent per capita. There are no figures specifically for the EU that they um, calculate, but its growth is predicted in all countries. Um, now, looking a bit at, as mentioned earlier, our report zooms in on metals and metal metallic minerals extraction and consumption. So looking a bit, a bit at these, and especially the ones required a lot in green and digital transition technologies, you can see here that metals in terms of weight are actually the smallest material extraction group, but they're predicted to be the fastest growing material group with a per capita increase of 63% by 2060. Um, metal extraction and processing also comes with very high environmental impacts um, per weight. And at the moment, the EU's metal footprint is 1.5 tonnes per capita. So this is 25% higher than the global average. And yeah, a really interesting fact is that the EU only makes up 6% of the world's population, but consumes 25 to 30% of metals produced globally. Um, now looking a bit more at the metals for the green transition. Um, looking at green transition technologies, we can see like wind, solar, electricity systems, batteries for electric vehicles and energy storage. We see that they're very material intensive and require a more complicated set of materials than fossil fuel based systems. Take copper, for example, it's used throughout the economy and it's estimated that electric vehicles use four times as much copper as fossil fuel vehicles. Predictions under continued economic growth show that if copper mining continues to increase, the economically extractable ores might be depleted within a century. Um, another recent study by the IEA stated that in the 2040s, the size of the global market for metals like lithium and copper will approach that for coal today. And another European Commission study shows that under a high demand scenario, solar and wind technologies will increase e-demand for lithium, dysprosium, cobalt, neodymium and nickel by up to 600% in 2030 and 1,500% in 2050. Um, for many metals and minerals used in green transition technologies, the EU is close to fully reliant on imports, often coming from less than a handful of countries. So, for example, 100% of battery grade lithium and rare earth elements are imported and with 78% of the former coming from Chile and 99% coming from China. Um, this isn't to say that the uh, movement to electric vehicles, moving to renewable energies is 100% necessary and must happen, but we'll touch later on the, it's putting it into context on the overall scale of our consumption and the need to reduce this. So Diego will talk more later about the impacts as well of consumption. And just a final note on before Diego takes over on digitalization and metal and mineral demand. So the digitalization of society is, as yeah, everyone has heard these days, is really claimed in mainstream debates to be necessary for modern development of society. Um, and this whole technical techno optimism arguing that the digital age, age promises more connected, dematerialized world where sustainability can coincide with technological advancements. Um, so while some of this may be true, the rapidly growing digital sector is another key driver of metal demand, not to mention energy demand, as we're seeing a lot of debates over the big data storage centers at the moment. Um, and Europeans own five times as many digital devices as people in the global south and double the global average. So I'll leave it there and pass over to Diego for the next part. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Maeve, and to the panelists and to all of you here with us today. I will now touch on the impacts of mining, the rate of growth of mining activity in Europe, and the narrative behind green mining. Uh, so to start us off, according to the EU's Joint Research Center, the environmental impacts of the consumption of an average European citizen are outside the safe operating space for humanity for nearly 40% of the impact categories investigated. Of note are the impacts from resource use, where the EU uses between 70% and 97% of the safe operating space available for the whole world, thus leaving less than 30% at best for the rest of the world. First off, mining is the deadliest industry for those who oppose it, 
In 2019, more environmental defenders were killed for opposing mining than in any other industry. Recently, this was further reinforced by Global Witness's latest findings, where the mining sector appeared once again among the most violent and disproportionately affected indigenous peoples and communities in the Global South. Mining for lithium, cobalt, manganese, platinum, aluminum, and copper have been associated with high or very high environmental and social risks. Globally, this includes more than 300 human rights abuse allegations, which are tied to more than 100 different mining operations, many of which are headquartered in Europe. But these numbers do not tell the whole story. In reality, human rights violations are likely much higher. Researchers and communities impacted by mining do not always have the capacity to elevate their struggles. In this case, an absence of evidence is not necessarily the evidence of absence. In terms of my environmental impacts, mining activities generate a lot of waste, having toxic effects on humans and ecosystems. Mining industry, and mining is, in the, is the industry which produces the largest amount of global waste and is the second largest waste stream in Europe. To give an idea, on average, to get one ton of copper, 200 tons of rock have to be dug up. As ore grades decrease, the social and ecological costs will increase in turn. If mining waste dams burst, they can cause severe, severe ecological damage and pose threats to surrounding communities. Even when idle, toxic contents can threaten surrounding bodies of water and local wildlife. Just over a decade ago, Europe was considered the region with the second highest number of tail and dam incidents in the world. So to allow mining in theory, you should have the community approval, but reality is different. Knowing the serious social and environmental costs, how are institutions changing the image of a damaging industry? Despite the sustainability rhetoric often expressed by mining companies and supported by many governments and international organizations, none of the largest mining companies around the world score high enough to meet societal and environmental standards, and that many companies show little sign of translating corporate commitments and standards into successful business practices. Though these findings consist of large multinationals and only two EU mines by European companies assessed, this is to be expected since, the, since um, the relative small amount of metal and mineral mining currently in the EU is, despite, is, is happening despite its high consumption. However, given the rapid increase of exploration and mining in Europe, these findings are concerning and point to a larger structural issue plaguing the mining industry in general. The, and, and in terms of greenwashing, though many metals and minerals are indeed needed for the uh, green transition technologies, many large mining companies and governments are promoting the concept of green mining by effectively, effectively greenwashing the industry. Green mining, therefore, erases the violent nature of extractivism. So, if the public, so within the public imagination, mining can be made green, then it is easier to shift the blame onto communities so that when communities fight for the right to decide their futures, they are labeled as having a not in my backyard attitude. This is evidenced by the fact that the Portuguese Secretary of State for Energy mentioned recently that those who are against mines are against life. Another point is that a very small amount of this increased mining will go to the, energy with the green transition. Metals like copper, iron, aluminum, or those for the green transition use overwhelmingly in construction and other sectors and also used significantly in the military sector. Global military operations continue to be deeply tied to mining sites and mining companies tend to conceal or downplay the role the minerals play in the arms trade. So I'm going to talk about the expansion of the extractive frontiers. Around the world, mining activity is greatly increasing. In Europe, there are already growing conflicts in Spain, Portugal, Sweden, and Ireland in parallel with increasing exploration licenses in these countries. For example, 27% of the Republic of Ireland <clears throat> and 25% of Northern Ireland are covered by exploration permits. In Spain, there were more than 2,000 mining applications filed in 2008 alone. And in Finland, approximately 11% of total land area has been reserved for mining exploration. Norway and Sweden have more than 500 and 600 exploration permits, respectively, including in Sápmi, the homeland of the Sámi indigenous people. I will, now be able, I will not be able to touch on the case studies, but I invite you to look into them. We deliberately chose these case studies based on their connection to European companies. Um, so uh, to, in this slide, there's a slide highlighting the prospections in Ireland and Finland. <clears throat> and lastly, the concept of extractivism, the resistance against it are not born out of isolation, but rather come from a structural understanding of the world as a result of historical processes. It's because colonial relations did not cease. In liberal democracies, we tend to diminish, purposely forget, or completely evade the historical legacies that are tied to overconsumption, continued human rights violations, environmental degradation, and climate change altogether. Without a doubt, European economies were built in large part through the colonization of the global south, 
channeling natural resources towards Europe to support European lifestyles and continue dominance. Though European colonial empire, empires as formal institutions are a thing of the past, colonial relations are seen everywhere we dare to look, even within Europe. The EU's large consumption and material footprint, therefore, is responsible for a disproportionate part of the depletion of common global natural resources and causes extensive environmental and social harms. This is why a reduction of material footprint is not only based on ecological common sense, but is also a moral imperative. So I will now go ahead and pass it over to Maeve to discuss the policy recommendations. Thanks, Diego. Yeah, so a bit on the current EU policy framework around these issues is extensive. Um, we'll take a bird's eye view and then go into details on some points. So like Jagoda mentioned, at the end of 2019, the European Commission published its Green Deal, an action plan outlining climate and environmental policies and initiatives that are being rolled out over the coming years. Although it represents a step forward in that environmental issues are being given high priority, it is still described as a new growth strategy for the EU. This implies acceptance of the damaging and illogical idea that we can create economic growth whilst over consuming in similar patterns and be green at the same time. There is a lack of critical analysis and action on EU consumption levels, as well as its globally unjust distribution and production relations. Within this agenda, metals and minerals extraction and consumption is predicted to keep increasing, as we know. The responsibility is on governments to drive the transition away from the neoliberal growth-based economic system and put policies in place that meet the needs of all people and the planet, not of corporations and profit. Incremental tweaks alone, like trying to decouple economic growth from resource consumption and impacts will not create the major transformations and shifts that are needed. So what needs to happen? Uh, one of the main things is around reducing resource use. So in order to stay within a safe operating space for the planet, the EU has to set hard limits on its resource use to actively downsize production and consumption. Resource reduction must be an immediate focus, not an afterthought that follows decarbonisation and greater efficiency. This means moving to a post-growth well-being circular society, shrinking the bad sectors and growing the good and implementing true resource democracy, whereby resources are, see, are seen as common public goods and distributed evenly, including for the benefit of future generations. Looking more on the material footprint side, so one of our main asks on a material footprint reduction target, uh, we know that climate policies are driven by emissions reductions targets, yet circular economy policies still lack material reduction targets. The evidence shows that the EU must reduce its material footprint by up to 65% by 2050 from current consumption levels with midterm targets. The target should be streamlined across all relevant EU policies and member states setting relevant targets to meet their fair share. They can be broken down into specific targets for individual material groups and or according to societal needs or product groups and services. The European Commission urgently needs to start this work on setting material footprint reduction targets. The European Parliament has demanded in three separate opinion reports this year alone that a target be set and the Netherlands and Finland are already setting their own targets. It's not enough for the EU material footprint to be simply monitored as part of the EU circular economy action plan, which is the, um, the plan that's currently on the table. It must become the central driving point of circular economy and environmental policies. And also a note that it must be accompanied by strong binding targets on reducing energy consumption overall and on land and water footprints. Um, yeah, looking a bit more at the practical ways to implement uh, resource use reduction, so post-growth policies and plans. The, the need to shrink sectors of the economy that are ecologically destructive and offer little or any social benefit such as the military sector, aerospace, fast fashion, single use packaging, or a completely digitalized future, and maintain or grow sectors that satisfy the basic needs and well-being of all, such as renovation of buildings, renewable energies, reusable packaging, cycling infrastructure, participatory activities, low impact activities, and agroecological food networks. Um, that's just to give an example of some. The EU can put policies in place that embody this, for example, encouraging a, switch, a shift from product ownership to usership that embrace work time reduction, laws that strictly regulate advertising um, and that greatly reduce car dependency. 
Um, looking at moving to a more circular society, so in terms of buildings and infrastructure um, that put reusing, repurposing and renovation first with binding circularity rules across the along the value chain. Um, these can be enacted within the EU strategy for a sustainable built environment and an overarching EU sustainable buildings regulation. Then on making sustainable products the norm, so legislative measures within the upcoming EU sustainable products policy and the batteries regulation to make products more durable, reusable, repairable, recyclable and energy efficiency, efficient and give people the right to repair um, and increase metal and mineral recycling. So Diego. Yes, thank you, Maeve. I'll uh, go ahead and touch on the additional ones. Uh, so the EU must recognize, protect and ensure the role of communities and indigenous peoples, both in the EU and outside particularly with respect to countries and regions it has colonized and continues to explore for resources. This means a true right to say no to mining for communities, holding industry to account for human rights and environmental harms, and an overhaul in trade and investment rules. There must be a binding common standards for all mining operations and no-go areas for new mining. So these include the planned mandatory EU human rights and environmental due diligence legislation that is currently um, being um, discussed. It must prioritize preventing human rights, climate and environmental harms to global supply chains by making companies liable for bad practices at home and abroad and give access to justice and remedy for victims and affected people in EU courts. The proposed EU batteries regulation includes due diligence requirements covering cobalt, natural graphite, lithium and nickel, but this should be expanded to include copper, iron, and aluminum. The outdated notions of social acceptance or social license to operate of a mining project must end and communities given a real independently governed right to say no. This includes the right to be previously and in a timely manner informed about the risks related to the activity before the mining company stalls itself, the right to be protected from any pressure or harassment, to be able to freely express concerns and demands about a project or company. Regarding the trade and investment agreements, <clears throat> they must contain binding and enforceable obligations for investors to respect human rights and the environment, including when acting abroad, complying with domestic rules and procedures of their host country. ISDS and other industry protection mechanisms must be abandoned. Other measures to look include restricting or banning imports linked to severe human rights, labor and environmental records. To stop unchecked biodiversity loss from mining, Natura 2000 and Ramsar sites, conserv other conservation areas, indigenous and community, oh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, I ICCA sites, as well as the deep sea and the Arctic should be strictly prohibited and, and protected as no-go areas for extractive industries. For truly sustainable mining operations, mining in the EU and by the EU and, and metal and mining, co uh, mining companies abroad should comply with the IRMA, uh, which is the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance Certification. IRMA certification happens at the mine site rather than at the company level and follows a step-by-step -step approach as opposed to a pass or fail one meaning better transparency and preventing companies from making overarching claims about their operations. IRMA certification can be included as mandatory in the EU taxonomy list, for example. Uh, remediation of old mining sites is also necessary. There are thousands of foreign mining sites in the EU that have not been properly restored and continue to contaminate and harm communities and their environment. A European standardized mechanism and shared database must be developed to account for these and to register the chemi their chemical composition Member states must use the regional development funds as well for all mining site rehabilitation. And in terms of mining waste, the use of upstream tailings dams must be banned in the EU, in the EU Extractive Waste Directive, and better controls developed on toxic mining waste with it treated um, within the country of origin. And now I'll pass it over to me. Yeah, so a final slide, just a last note on um, talking about the, the broader cultural shift that's needed to build better societies. The, the current the philosophy of continuous growth and expansion has really become entrenched in Western societies. But study after study shows that after a certain threshold, the vast majority, which the vast majority of Europeans have already reached, material wealth does not lead to a corresponding increase in happiness, well-being or health. Um, societal values should be firmly rooted in a deep commitment to a fair share consumption of resources and to the fundamental belief that humans are intrinsically equal value. Foundational values include sufficiency, care and empathy, together with equality, inclusiveness and autonomy. So I'll leave it there and hand it over to Tim to um, get the reactions from the panel. Thank you. Well, thanks so much uh, to both of you. As you mentioned, it's a substantive piece of work. There's lots to dig into. 
And it's great to see the chat uh, being used, <laughs> quite, uh, quite lively uh, exchanges already on there. Um, please do remember to use the Q&A function for specific questions that you want panel members to address, because it becomes a little bit easier for us to sort those through. And just on that, there is one in there. So as an incentive, I'm going to ask uh, Maeve and Diego just to respond to that one uh, first, which is just about the uh, the global numbers that you presented, the, the future projections. Are they taken from the International Resource Panel uh, or what sources are you using is a question. Maeve? Yeah, so in, so both from the International Resources Panel and the OECD. Yes, the OECD. You can see in the report that we quote isn't it? the two the different numbers. Yeah. 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 Okay, fantastic. So let's move uh, then to the to the panel, get some reactions um, to the report. And we're going to start with uh, Sarah Mathieu, uh, who is a, a Green MEP from Belgium and also a city councillor for Ghent. And uh, Sarah is, uh, like all good MEPs, juggling uh, an imminent uh, speaking slot in the plenary at the moment. So um, we're delighted to have you. Thanks for coming. And uh, we understand that you're going to make your intervention. You may then have to slip away uh, make your make your intervention in plenary and then uh, we're hoping come back but um, please over to you for your reactions to to the report yeah thanks a lot uh, for having me uh, it's a lot of uh, of things to unpack from this report so i'll try to prioritize really where i felt the most uh, political tension in my role as envy rapporteur on the parliament's report on critical raw materials so uh, my first point would be the subtitle of the report. Uh, you're really making a bold case for cutting EU resource consumption. Now, uh, to be frank, that's by no means a popular statement, uh, certainly not amongst uh, a lot of the lawmakers uh, in the parliament, but I do think it's very important. Um, while you know, you're advocating for a limit on consumption, uh, at the same time also talking about the expansion of, of the boundaries of the debate, beyond those typical uh, cliches of investing in innovation, efficiency improvements, etc. And I think it's really good because limits that actually force us to choose what is essential in our lives are key. So I think um, this is actually a, an important uh, point of the report. For instance, also the fact that you propose ambitious political choices such as embracing working time reduction because we know that this actually reduces footprints uh, considerably and maybe just as important, it makes people happier. Um, so I think that that's really uh, also human well-being is key in making the case for material reduction in consumption. But needless to say, uh, that was this was really hard sell uh, when we were negotiating uh, within uh, the parliament. But after a long struggle, we did manage to get clear language language on binding targets for EU material and uh, consumption targets by 2030 in our NV opinion. Our colleagues in industry, however, refused uh, to accept it in the final ITRA lead report. Well, in any case, uh, the parliament, of course, adopted the request on uh, the, the same uh, questions in the report on the circular economy action plan. So we do expect the commission to address that uh, later in in, uh, in this uh, term of office. But um, another small but important request in the MP opinion is really directly relevant, I think, uh, for Peter Handley, since uh, policy is based on future scenarios. We do want future CRM demand scenarios by the GRC to really include all possible options for minimizing resource consumption. And that, of course, includes systemic change, shift to public, public transport, for instance, uh, shared electrical vehicles, biking, etc. Uh, just a small example from my own backyard. Uh, there's a study by Vito in Belgium that shows that the demand for cobalt could be reduced by a whopping 5.5 to even 8.5 times by just maximizing public transport and shared urban mobility over a shift from combustion engine to electrical vehicles. So it's clear it's a double win. Uh, we reduce our resource demand, and of course, we're making our cities more uh, livable and uh, equitable. Um, about mining, well, if I've learned anything about large projects in my political career is that it's imposing them top down, that's really a, a recipe for disaster. 
people will fight tooth and nail to bury them. And honestly, why wouldn't they? In many cases, local communities bear the burden and they don't enjoy any benefits from it, financial or otherwise at all. So um, I feel like setting up conferences on responsible mining that won't win the hearts and minds of people. And ideally, scarce resources should really be governed as commons for the benefit of those who are directly involved, as the report indeed rightly proposes. But we have to be honest, that's not going to happen overnight. So that's why in parallel, we really need to use the momentum on due diligence legislation, I think. Here, I mean, not just the law itself, but really to apply it in different policy areas. Um, due diligence requirements, for instance, in the proposed batteries regulations, that's a good uh, example. And within EU borders, we really can take this a step further. We can and we should at least guarantee that local authorities ensure effective and inclusive participation when it comes to the permit pr uh, procedures. And of course, we need to prohibit mining in protected areas such as nature 2000, Natura 2000. Um, so in the EV committee, this was really a battle. Uh, we fought hard uh, to include it. It really nearly didn't make it. And I really want to flag that here because we know uh, it will be up for a vote in plenary soon. And some other groups, they really want to kill those paragraphs. So we will need you from civil society to make enough noise to prevent that this is really about preventing that mining would be possible uh, in nature reserves i think for us that's a really really cl clearly a, a red line so i will have to leave it at that and uh, i will try to come back to you after i'm back from the plenary apologize for this thank you so much sarah that's fantastic um and great to have the links to the extensive work that's been happening in the Parliament um, on these very issues uh, on multiple different files, and we'll, we'll pick up on some of those in a moment. Let's come to Peter Handley, who is uh, Head of Unit for Energy Intensive Industries and Raw Materials in DG Grow, and um, has, has been closely involved in many of these debates for uh, some time. Um, it's brilliant to have you with us, Peter. There's a few challenges directly uh, for you there um, from the MEP. But first, let's let's hear your reactions in general to the report, um, and then we'll, come, we'll, we'll we'll dive into some more details after that. Over to you, Peter. Thanks. Well, I've not always been Mr. Raw Materials and Energy Intensive Industries, which sounds demonic uh, in the context of today's events. Way back in uh, 92, I was at the Rio conference uh, trying to pull together the threads of environment and development and actually helping to put together the language about reducing consumption, changing consumption and production patterns. And of course, it was there that the uh, the first ever uh, climate instrument, the framework agreement was put together. Um, if I just make a leap from there to now, what, what uh, keeps me awake at night is the speed of change on, on, on greenhouse gas emissions, right? I mean, in Rio, we were emitting, I mean, from the energy and power sector, it was, it was like uh, 22 billion tonnes of CO2 a year. Just before COVID, it was 36.6, but it's going up like that. And what really worries me is the speed of change and when we're going to run out of our carbon uh, uh, bank account. And you have to link that conversation because that's what strikes me as missing from your discussion. There's, it's like everything's bad about the raw materials, but the reason that there's so much focus on raw materials in policy terms is because we see that we've got this fossil fuel driven economy and the coal thing is especially bad, but the others as well. And we're trying to accelerate the shift away from the fossil fuels by transforming the energy system, uh, the mobility system, and tra tra transforming industry as well. So um, I think you, if you look at all the analyses, you can disagree about forecast levels of demand in future. And I would fully agree we should be doing everything possible to suppress the amount of demand on the, on the planet's resources. But I think the facts are for a given amount of performance, uh, a non-fossil fuel way of doing things tends to be um, trading uh, away the use of fossil fuels and you get a more intensive use of materials, right? Because actually fossil fuels are quite efficient. Uh, so that, that conversation needs to have both dimensions to make, to make a proper sense, I think. 
Now, the second thing is, it looks like it's Europe, the bad guy here. This conversation has to be put in its global context because, you know, Europe could make maximum efforts. We could cut up our consumption of things by half, but that won't change the world situation, right? Because it's volume terms and per capita, what's happening in China is infinitely bigger uh, impact on the planet. Plus you've got countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, which have legitimate rights to develop and they're growing populations. So their consumption of the world's resources is gonna grow. So if you just say, Europe, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. Okay, it'll take you so far, but it will not really have that impact uh, that you need on the planet uh, in the time necessary. Now, I think we've seen quite a lot of reports, including the one done for uh, MEP Heinrich Hahn by the Eco Institute, which showed that um, there are inefficiencies, uh, there are areas of injustice, there are um, all sorts of problems. But at the, at the end of the day, you're not going to avoid uh, primary raw materials if you want to achieve your, your energy and climate goals. Um, and that means, yes, we'll do everything we can to really ramp up recovery, recycling of what's already in the European economy, which is, you know, there's a lot of potential there that's untapped. But where we do need primary raw, raw materials, do we want to really just outsource that to developing countries where they don't care about internalizing the environmental and human and social costs as much as we do? Should we not, as Commissioner Breton said in his speech in June, actually accept more responsibility? Because as Maeve said, we produce little, but we consume a lot. So we're importing all this um, negative, negative aspects because we're not actually in control of, of what's going into the, the products that we consume in Europe. So I, I would plead actually for more, you know, let's not say nothing in Europe, let's, let's do more in Europe, but let's do it right. Let's do it by the rule book. Let's, if necessary, reinforce our, our, our environmental uh, regulatory framework. Um, I don't know if you've seen, but just uh, a few weeks ago, we published what we call uh, principles for sustainable uh, raw materials in Europe, right? It looks at set of principles which we've developed with member states, with industry and civil society at every opportunity to participate in the process as well. You know, what does it mean to do it the right way in Europe, right? So that's that would be my plea. Look at things in terms of, you know, how you do the trade-off between your desire to get rid of fossil fuels and what that means in practice. Let's look at the global picture and try and act on that, uh, on that level. Let's look at better global governance of the whole uh, raw materials sphere, whether it's in the UN system or elsewhere. There needs to be some control on just pure rapaciousness by the countries that have the largest appetite, right? Or the regions of the world that have the largest appetite. And let's, let's have a proper conversation about what are, the, what are the conditions under which we can do things responsibly uh, in Europe. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks for that, uh, Peter. So we'll come back to you, no doubt, on some of those uh, questions. But I do want to first bring in now um, Katerina alves uh who's a representative of uh, community groups um, that are affected by uh, lithium mining in uh, northern Portugal and can give us a perspective of, of the community and the rights holders in that case. Over to you, Katerina. Um, hi, good afternoon. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I come from Covers do Porroso, um, which is a community that lives um, where Mina do Porroso lithium mining project is located in northern Portugal as part of the Porroso region, which has been recognized by FAO as a globally important agricultural heritage site. Um, a number of open pit mines are being planned in a large green and water rich area, threatening um, the environment and the sustainable way of living of the communities that have been there for over eight centuries. So licenses were issued and they were altered without effective public consultation taking place, resulting in an unopposed, extensive and very aggressive prospection campaign, um, feeding speculation and leading the junior miner who owns the license to make fantastic claims about the project. Um, since 2017, we have been trying to understand how we have arrived at the situation that we're in, um, us and others like us. And what we discovered is that the drive for mining in Portugal is the perverse consequences of um, the EU push for the mining of strategic minerals. So we've had um, politicians were spurred on by misleading claims about the Portuguese lithium reserves. Um, and the environmental and financial gains to be had and, and magnified 
by the promise of um, a value chain being built around it. Um, so the government um, bought into and heavily promoted um, the lithium mining, attracting the attention of mining companies all over the world. So we had misguided and misinformed politicians looking for quick uh, political, economic and environmental fixes, um, coupled with a permissive licensing system. Um, and so it resulted in a surge of prospection and mining licenses being issued to opportunistic mining companies with varying degrees of experiences and capabilities. Um, furthermore, the plans afoot for an international tender for exploration licenses covering um, eight Portuguese regions. Um, and of course, exploration means mining. Uh, mining companies are not charities, so they are not um, about to reveal minerals if they are not going to be allowed to mine them. Um, another interesting fact is that the public consultation actually came out last week, two days after elections took place. Um, there are also two areas that add up to 550 square kilometres that are joining and are centred around Mina do Provozo, um, and they have been excluded from the tender, but have been told, we have been told that they will be offered to the mining companies that already hold mining licences in the area. So um, these 10 areas add up to about 4% um, of the Portuguese territory. Um, and all this is despite concerns that were raised um, over the new mining laws um, that somehow have seemed to come into effect without um, proper parliamentary scrutiny. Um, so nearly three years down the line, the result of the prospection in Mina do Barroso can still be seen. Um, it can be seen now, today, um, on the ground and even in, on Google Maps. And so that speaks volume about, about the mining company, the government, and the trust that we can have in both. The environmental impact assessment report produced by the company um, heightened our concerns, concerns even further. And we've had to get our own independent scientific and technical studies where we could um, in order to um, better understand and, and find evidence of what we could already see ourselves. Um, the filtered tailings storage facility, for instance, is described by an independent expert as a product of reckless creativity with an exceedingly optimistic approach to safety measures. Um, and in a country where 95% of the environmental impact um, assessments receive favorable rulings from the Portuguese Environmental Agency, um, in spite of all its failings and the in, uh, unmitigated environmental catastrophe that we face, um, we hold little hope of it being rejected. And we wonder who and how we will be able to make anyone accountable for it. Um, in the midst of all of this, we are now up against a government lobby and a propaganda campaign led by the mining company. Um, they have paid for news features and interviews in local and national papers, TVs and radios, even opinion articles, the latest of which, of which by the mining company CEO of all people. And daily we face the mining company's agents darkening our doorsteps and uh, with veiled threats that if we don't sell our land now, we will be left with nothing. While at the same time, they're looking into ways to tap into the recovery and resilience grant to fund the mine. And let's not forget the EU Green Mining Conference in Lisbon promoted by the Portuguese government and where the mining industry took pride of place. Um, in Corpus de Borroso, I heard the following comment. And so it is that they invite the foxes to advise them on how to protect the chicken coop. The community will not let themselves be fooled by the emperor's new clothes and will not have anyone fool them or shame them into saying that grey is green, that mines are sustainable and that we do not and will never and we do not and will never regard mining companies as saviors that can bring a sustainable development. We that have always lived sustainably resent being sacrificed so that others can maintain the resource intensive way of life. We have equal rights as everyone else and our livelihoods of equal value and dignity as any others. So let's stop the drive for mining more and more resources. Thank you. Thanks so much, Katerina. So, so uh, powerful to have the perspective from, from communities and you know, there's always, I think, a, a risk in debates like this, uh, that they operate at too abstract a level. And you forget that these are people's lives um, uh, that are that are at stake on the ground. 
Let me just have one follow up question, if I may, to you, Katerina, and then we'll come back to Peter, then I'm going to open up to, to a few of the questions that we're getting in uh, from the participants as well. You, you spoke quite powerfully there, Katerina, about the kind of imbalance in power between you know, local communities and whether it's the, the mining companies or um, local authorities. Uh, in your view, what, what would make the biggest difference to redress that imbalance of power to give a greater uh, say to local communities? What, what are the one or two things that you know, would have made a, a bigger difference in your experience uh, in, in this case? Well, uh, I think one of the things that, that it, you know, to us is, is very clear is that you know, we didn't hear anything from the government themselves from our legal, from our representatives, uh, we found out about the the changes in the license um, through the mining company. So they they basically sent the mining company to our door and just basically left it there um, to 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 basically um, talk to us. Um, no one actually talked to us or, or actually asked us what we thought about um, this project that, you know, that this mining company uh, was interested, um, you know, and in fact, you know, the mining, the, the license, there was an, an old license that we knew about um, that, you know, we, as we understood at the time was from, you know, in a small area, in a small um, away from, from the, 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 the village. And, you know, over time, nothing happened. There was no mining done. And then suddenly, you know, we had a foreign company, you know, um, a company from um, that, that we didn't recognize suddenly um, took over this license and was telling us that they were going to mine lithium. Um, and the greatest surprise to us was actually the extent um, of, of, of the project itself, you know, how much they were going to mine and then, of course, where they were going to mine. Um, so, so I think, you know, basically getting the, the communities involved not just actually leaving the, um, um, the the mining company to 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 speak to the communities um, is 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 key really. Perfect, thanks, Katerina. Um, let me just uh, pick up on that, and also one of the the lead questions, the most popular questions that we've had from the audience, which is about whether the right to say no uh, can be established effectively and meaningfully in some sort of formal, uh, independent, transparent process. May for Diego, but perhaps Diego, um, do, you, do you want to take this one? What, what would, uh, what would a, uh, a more effective process to give communities like those that Katerina um, is fighting uh, alongside uh, a bigger say and, and ultimately the opportunity uh, to withhold consent? What would that look like in the EU context? Uh, thank you, Tim. <clears throat> so actually this is a, there's a difficult question in terms of, of what the current policy allows for. Uh, this has been a question that's also been uh, discussed within our different NGO networks. Uh, it is definitely a, a, an issue that we're exploring. There are some examples, for example, from the Philippines, uh, though I don't necessarily believe, I believe that it has been taken away, uh, but the idea generally holds that you could do it, uh, pathetically speaking, within a multi-level uh, of governance. So for example, uh, having a referendum um, on, on, on a mining site and then having a local government and, and then the regional government agree, whether it's not, it, it agree on that it's not taking place, then that not allowing for the national government to impose then the project itself. I mean, this is just a hypothetical example. It is not necessarily <laughs> something that is, uh, that, that, that we, we, I mean, th the thing is though that this is gonna look differently from different countries and different uh, localities. So that is something to explore. The thing is though, while we might not have the answer within a uh, within a, the European context as of yet, we're, what we're trying to do is really to open the conversation. That this is a thing, there's a movement that is being born out of South Africa and is now coming up on, on the, on the should come be coming up on the political agenda. So it's really something to explore. And actually the EB, we're planning on doing some research on this to effectively look at how this could be implemented within the EU and suggest some policies where uh, uh, municipalities um, or other uh, or other cities can also look into how they can establish a right to say no. Just but the the fact of the matter is that as long as this is something that is 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 commonly understood as a real possibility, is actually how we're going to be able to move forward. But I think that Maeve has actually uh, done also a little bit of uh, research on this. Maybe Maeve, if you have any any comments, any anything additional? No. Yeah. 
No problem. I, I mean, perhaps the, the due diligence legislation, which uh, Sarah uh, referred to earlier, could also be an opportunity here to really um, uh, strengthen the requirements on, on companies to establish uh, that there is indeed free prior informed consent from communities. Peter, let me bring you in on this one. You refer to the um, sustainable raw, raw materials uh, principles for sustainable raw materials in Europe. To what extent, you know, the, the, the case that you've just heard about, to what extent do you think that would contravene those principles or, you know, is there something in those principles that should, you know, if they were respected, uh, that should prevent those, those types of cases from occurring? I'm going to read you the relevant principle. Um, it's uh, this, this um, just for reference, uh, I'll try and post it up in the chat, uh, published by the uh, Office of Publications earlier in September. And uh, there's um, social principles, economic and governance principles, and then environmental principles, but all kind of compressed into basically eight principles, um, each of which is then linked in an annex to how it's implemented in practice through the European regulatory framework. The one, the one about this, it does not go as far as a veto. It says, um, sustainable raw materials extraction and processing support human rights, communities and sound governance through ABC. And the one that's relevant here, apart from human rights and stuff is, there should be a constructive and active dialogue with communities and workers concerned, including those of indigenous people to advance the social, economic and institutional development of those communities. The dialogue should be effective and transparent and deliver on reporting arrangements with concerned stakeholders. Right, now, um, there's also all sorts of things locked in through the European regulatory framework about um, uh, uh, what you have to do when when you're doing a, an environmental impact assessment. You know, there are things dotted around all sorts of European rules saying how communities should be consulted. But I don't know personally what the veto right means. Right. Who has that veto right? Is it is it, for example, the last citizen in a village who has the right to say no when everyone else in that community would add desperately love to avoid uh, the population drifting away from a region because there's no jobs there anymore. I mean, where do you draw the line on the veto, right? How do you embody that kind of societal interest? You know, and I'm not saying that the views of a government should override those of a region or, or of a community living in a place, but there should be a proper balance of interest going on, right? Otherwise, nothing will ever happen anywhere. Um, sorry to be a bit provocative, but that's why that's what so, I would so, say. But, but to what extent then do you think that those principles would be sufficient? You know, this presumably this is a voluntary list, um, which is, you know, has links to various regulatory uh, frameworks. But I think, you know, what we're hearing, I think, is a, such a patchwork of approaches, you know, isn't serving the interests of communities, at least in this case, to really understand how they can best you know, advocate for their rights. And, and so if, if, if we wanted to see a clearer uh, uh, set of mechanisms through which communities can have their voices heard, their concerns uh, understood, you know, perhaps up to the point of um, uh, withdrawing their consent for a project, you know, do you think that what you've got at the moment as the commission is adequate to the task or, or does it need further elaboration at the regulatory level? Um, I think it's an open question, but uh, I heard Sarah say, I think it was Sarah saying, uh, not seeing much value in having a round table process on sustainable mining in Europe. I think we do precisely need to have that conversation. It's not a one off conversation. It's a process because we need to hear from the communities. We need to hear from the authorities like town or regional authorities, how they see things happening, um, because I, I, I don't think we've hit the right balance yet. You know, uh, you heard from my first intervention. I, I think we are going to need raw materials uh, and we're going to need to get those raw materials in a much better way environmentally and socially than has been done historically. No one's saying that bad things haven't happened in the past, but they don't have, have to happen in the same bad way if we're smart as we try to be uh, as human beings going forward, right? We have to do this in a much cleaner way with a lower climate and environmental footprint and with a much better um, ESG performance. Great. OK, um, I want to come back in a moment uh, to questions about uh, the material footprint target. We haven't forgotten about those. Um, just uh, looking a little bit at the questions here, and I can see um, maybe this is one for you, Maeve uh, or Diego or, or indeed Katerina. Um, to what extent do you know, we've heard quite a lot from all of you about, you know, the, the negative cases, the uh, examples of what seems to amount to a clearly bad practice. 
in the sector. To what extent can you point also to examples of good practice? Because even as you've acknowledged yourself, there will be a need uh, to increase, uh, at least in the in the interim, to some extent, uh, production of some of these metals in the in the low carbon transition. So there will be a need for some level of uh, extraction. You know, where are the good examples that we can point to? Is there anything you've got in your report on this, or other examples that you can uh, you can contrast with some of the examples that we've heard so far? Who would like to try that one? Uh, Katrina, do you want to come in? I, I just wanted to say that, um, again, we're going back to the same idea of this, um, you know, talking about um, having the, the um, mining companies, they're not charities, okay, they, they're mining for a reason, and actually they're given too much power, too much control, there isn't enough monitoring, there isn't enough, um, there isn't in, enough control from the government and from anyone, and so they, they're just given free, free uh, are, you know, they're, they're just left to just do um, as they pleased, um, you, you know, so that they achieve their, their aim somehow, you know. So, you know, the prime example is, is this, you know, having, you know, national papers in Portugal, you know, publish, uh, you know, uh, opinion articles by the mining CEO. I mean, where have you heard of that? Where, where is that? You know, where does that stop? So basically, um, I think that, you know, the mining companies, you know, they're, they need to sort of be controlled much more tightly and much more um, control needs to be had over them, um, over what they can do, because what they're trying to do is manipulate, um, the, you know, public opinion, you know, manipulate and actually taking control over what the communities actually say. So you, you, what you've got in here is a community, the community closest to the mine, who's actually saying, no, we're not looking at, you know, one person there we're looking at the whole community who actually hosted um you know an event this summer to basically say no we don't want mining mining so it was the whole community that was there that said this is this is this is going to be a catastrophe for us this is going to be the end of it um it's not about uh right okay this this community uh um is going to gain from this the community is not going to gain basically what you're doing is you we've got a chicken that lays eggs and you're killing the chicken to then give us, you know, some of the bones. That's what's, what that's what we're talking about here. Um, you know, so the community is not going to gain from this. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Katerina. May for Diego, do you, do you want to have a stab at, um, you know, where, where there could be examples of better practice uh, that you can point to? Yeah, um, well, I want to support what Katerina said and also add that it's not the it's not the role it's not the job of ngos to kind of promote any good we know that any kind of mining any kind of um extraction has some impact on the environment and people so um and the role of ngos is to stick up for people and the environment so, so that's just a first point that it's not the role of ngos to go around promoting what maybe is a better mine than another mine um, but in saying that, yeah, like in reality, of course, we are going to need some kind of mining to live on Earth in the future. We need way less mining, and that's the the whole reason behind the report. Um, but for the mining, we 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 do need. Um, I mean, we mentioned Diego mentioned the Irma certification. That's really important. Some of the project within that could. Um, maybe be up to a higher higher standard and um, there's also yeah i've seen some for example I, i've talked before to talk before about a lithium project in an old mining area in cornwall um and they found some lithium deposits the whole almost the whole the community seems to fully support it um there was old coal mining jobs which are now going to be lithium mining it's going to the uk economy so i mean there's some examples like this but ngos it's not our job to go publicly supporting them um yeah sure no indeed not 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 necessarily to publicly support, but it, of course you know if we if we want to say what well, we don't want can be useful to to point to examples of better practice diego you had your your hand up do you want to come in on this and then i see sarah has uh, rejoined welcome back and and, uh, and i'm going to come to you in just a second as well uh, Diego. It's just a just a very small comment. Um, <clears throat> uh, Linda uh, Sullivan and um, and uh, also uh, uh, from the Yes to Life No to Mining Network, they have released some uh, interesting research regarding uh, the current mining policies in Ireland uh, and also in Scandinavia. 
And I think this is worth looking into because especially in the Scandinavia, Finland and Sweden, um, talk a lot about sustainability and sustainable mining. I mean, sustainable mining was a concept that was really born in Finland. Uh, yet when we look at the research on the ground, uh, it tells a different story. So again, we, 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 these voices are often unheard. And, and like I mentioned before, research is, is lacking in this area. So we need to focus on that. Another thing about <clears throat> how to do things right. Um, honestly, I, I haven't found uh, that information. I, I, we haven't found where community, where uh, mining industry is doing things right. Um, also, there is a horizon project looking into resourcing, which is called resourcing. It's looking into sustain, uh, responsible resourcing. Uh, they might have a little bit more information because that's exactly what they're looking into. But then there's other things about companies doing things right. Well, there is other things that we can do. For example, what about common on ownership of a mining project, if it were to be the case, you know what I mean? Um, when we concentrate power to, to the private industry, then the sector is going to extract more and more until it's no longer uh, needed. And then it's going to leave the area and then the, the what what's left behind the communities have to have to uh, clean up. I mean, or or the or the estate. So this happens continuously. So it, one of the things we mentioned in the report, uh, common ownership of of extractive activities, if they are to take place, of course, we're considering uh, consumption reduction massively. I mean, this could be an alternative future. So it, these are the things that we need to talk about. Thank, thanks, Diego. Yeah, no, the, uh, I think that's a really interesting point that's made in the report about moving towards alternative ownership structures in, in, in the extractive industry. Sarah, um, welcome back. I hope your intervention went well. The debate is uh, proceeding well. Um, I just wanna to come to you with one, one question uh, uh, following on from the discussion we've just been having, and then I'm gonna move the discussion on uh, to a final few questions about the material footprints targets uh, issue. Um, but we were just discussing um, what, what are the opportunities in the current regulatory framework in the EU uh, or in, the, uh, in, in those which have been proposed, such as the due diligence uh, legislation, to give communities like those that Katerina is, is representing more of a say in ultimately uh, perhaps you know, withdrawing their consent for, a, for an extractive project uh, to, go, to go ahead. You, you had mentioned the due diligence legislation at the beginning. We've heard from Peter about the principles for sustainable raw materials in Europe and the extent to which that may or may not be sufficient uh, to uh, to rebalance power uh, in uh, more in the favor of communities can you give us a sense of which you know what what are the tools that you would like to see uh, available to communities like Katarina's to give them more power uh, in decisions over extractive projects yeah um like i said i think it's really important if you want to have support uh, uh, from local communities for these kind of products that you really have real participation and that it's not just a top-down slideshow where you tell people what you want to do, but that there's actually, well, real participation in the sense that um, they're really listened to and that they also have an impact uh, on, on what's going to, uh, to be happening. And I think at that point, um, legislation is really at the moment not strong enough. Um, so that's really what we're advocating for uh, in our report to make sure that this is not just something um, cosmetical, um, but that it's really a part of the legislative uh, process and that, well, when there is uh, a permit, for instance, uh, to be discussed, um, that the, uh, the instances, the public instances that are responsible for this, actually have to take that uh, into account. I think another thing is really about added value. Um, and uh, I mean, often we've seen a lot of protests um, when it comes to uh, these projects, uh, specifically because there's no added value uh, for the people that are living um, around uh, the site. And well, there I would make a little bit the bridge uh, towards what we're really saying about opportunities for circular economy, uh, for instance, where we really think um, if that is the, the, the way that you, you choose to go and indeed uh, recycle a lot of more of these uh, critical raw materials, for instance, within Europe, that really the, the sites of the mines um, would be the, the good place to, uh, to do that. In that sense, uh, you would have 
well, sustainable jobs uh, in the future there uh, and not just um, have the extraction and afterwards um, nothing, uh, nothing in return. But I think it's it's clear that current legislation is is really not uh, not sufficient, uh, and that's really what we're advocating for in our uh, in our report that needs to be voted. Perfect. Thank, thanks so much for that. Um, we we're, we're moving through the debate now. Um, uh, I guess we're coming into the final straight. Uh, great to see the chat uh, continuing to um, uh, to be very active. This you know, lots of interesting case studies that are being uh, referred to different parts of Europe, different sectors, uh, different regions. Thanks a lot for those. I'm sure that's gonna be really useful uh, to um, for all participants and, and, and the panelists to take away as well. So do keep those coming. Don't forget to put any final questions uh, in the Q&A if you want to get them addressed uh, before the end of the debate. I'm just gonna come now to the issue of material footprints. I'll come back to you, Peter. Um, it's not the first time you've heard uh, the demand from the parliament and, and from NGOs, I'm sure, uh, for the establishment of material footprint targets. Um, I think it's fair to say there is a, an increasing uh, clarity in the academic literature about the, the importance of limiting uh, resource, uh, aggregate resource consumption. And we know, I think all of us uh, well, that the, the areas in which the EU has made most progress have in terms of environmental policy have been in those areas where there have been legally binding uh, science-based uh, reduction targets, not least uh, with regard to greenhouse gas emissions as, as you referred to yourself. So, I mean, what do you, what do you make of this case for uh, the establishment of material footprint targets? I know that you said at the beginning, well, if only the EU does it, you know, it won't have any impact. But of course, one could have said the same thing about greenhouse gas emission reduction targets at one point uh, as well. So the EU has obviously led the way there. Can, can the EU lead the way internationally in establishing material footprint targets in, in your view? Well, I've got a fairly long uh, institutional memory and I do remember the first circular economy action plan, which contained uh, precisely this kind of target and which um, Franz Timmermans was very proud to withdraw as the first act of the Juncker Commission. <laughs> so um, one of the reasons for not liking a, a, a blunderbuss, uh, sorry, that's probably a bit English, but, you know, um, a, a broad uh, kind of a blunt instrument like a, a, a single number is that there's a, there's a world of difference between um, 20 tons of uh, limestone and uh, 20 grams of some real niche high value, a critical raw material, which you cannot do without, right? You just mass them all together in some kind of target and it's not gonna, it's not gonna do the business, right? So there has to be some, you know, differentiating the, the apples from the pears. Um, now, I think we probably need to have more analytical work on precisely what are the best levers for, for incentivizing reducing use of materials in products right is it a target i'm not convinced but you know ngos can do their piece uh, think tanks can do their piece and the commission can do its its work on uh, thinking how we can drive down the, the overall uh, material footprint getting the the most amount of performance out of the fewest amount of materials and trying to uh, get that that process to happen uh, in in the global value chains because we're not an island right you know, much of what we get is produced elsewhere and a lot of it's produced in China. So, you know, let's ask our friends in the International Resources Panel, for example, who look very much at this question of material footprint, um, uh, planetary boundaries and circularity to see if they can come up with some useful uh, input to influence uh, European policy. I don't know if they're on the call. I think they've done that. Um... Uh, I think, and I think they're, recommend, they're recommending exactly the target that I think the colleagues have put in their report. But Maeve, do you want to come back on, on that? Yeah, I just want to say, Peter, you're, you're, frozen. you're, you're frozen, Maeve. You're, frozen. you're very welcome to influence. I think the missing lever we have. Am I here now? I'm back. OK. <laughs> You mentioned, um, yeah, more research on the levers of how we can reduce consumption, uh, civil society, researchers, the commission, and the commission are the missing, they're one of the key levers that can drive this forward, and they're the ones that are missing at the moment. I know you're in uh, a sector, you're not in DG Environment who kind of lead on this, but it would be really great if you could also internally push the commission on this, because 
we're really trying to make it happen. And in terms of the global, yeah, you're totally right. This needs to also happen on a global scale. Um, the commission actually a couple of years ago produced a report where they said they were going to set up a circular economy, like global group at the UN Environment Assembly, and it would look into establishing a safe operating space for the world and a resource budget. Um, and that was actually taken out at the last minute and they kind of reduced the priorities thinking that other countries wouldn't sign up to such a, um, a strong commitment on developing resource budget. So that was um, an interesting development. So I think the EU could do more to also uh, push other countries on this and internally. Before, before we come back to Peter on this one, uh, let me just bring in Sarah as well. Um, uh, as you as you mentioned in your opening remarks, you know, the Parliament has de debated this a number of times, and not, and not just in the context of the second circular economy action plan, but had also made that call uh, in its report on the first uh, CAP as well. So this is this is uh, something that the Parliament has thrashed out at length. It hasn't always been easy, as you mentioned. Um, uh, do you want to just give us a flavour of um, why you think in the end that th this is such an important issue for parliamentarians? And, and um, uh, you know, what, uh, what, what's been the basis for carrying this through the, the votes in, uh, in, in the parliament? What has helped to convince um, the unconvinced uh, to sign up to this proposal? Well, um, I think it's, it's, it's a really important issue anyway. And I think that most of my colleagues uh, in the parliament do really agree. Uh, is that an easy uh, thing to do? No, uh, but it's also not unrealistic. I think that a lot of member states are actually already implementing this and going further uh, than, uh, than what we're, we're saying, for instance, on the European level. Um, yeah, the Netherlands, for instance, will have its ecological footprint by 2050. You know, um, you always will have some front runners uh, uh, there, and uh, sometimes it really helps in certain member states if, if well, um, a member state is already convinced, it's easier also to, uh, to convince my colleagues uh, of this that it's feasible. Um, I also think you shouldn't underestimate uh, the Brussels effect. Uh, in the sense that, well, when we as Europeans uh, make a decision, it does have a huge effect on uh, the rest of the world. And uh, maybe finally, when it comes to more like the world economy, uh, one of the things that I'm uh, really focusing on as well, uh, coming from uh, the Committee of uh, International Trade, is really everything to do with WTO. Uh, and I think there uh, we could also have a lot of uh, better work done than, uh, than, uh, than is the case right now when it comes to uh, ecological footprints of, uh, of goods, uh, for instance. Um, so that's one of the things where uh, I want to be focusing on uh, in the next uh, couple of months and years uh, to get some ambition on, the, on WTO level uh, as well, because I think but this is one of the crucial tools uh, when it comes to uh, tackling uh, the climate crisis. Yeah, perfect. We, we're getting, we're drawing to the end now. I'm going to give Peter a um, chance just to come back uh, on that. Peter, you, you'd surely agree that we wouldn't have made the progress we've made on greenhouse gas emission reductions if there hadn't, in the absence of binding targets, albeit that we always need a range of instruments, of course, to actually achieve them. But surely that's been a, a key part of the mix. Um, you know, can you see a pathway here to the Commission doing more work on this? Um, possibly. I'm not. I'm not here to commit the Commission to regulatory action. We have a we have a right of initiative and we have processes for that. But we've certainly uh, heeded the the language in the European Parliament's uh, resolution on the Circular Economy Action Plan. But um, um, that's really as much as I can say. Actually, I'm quite interested in reading the chat because every time I open my mouth, I get 10 comments sort of tearing it apart. So I think maybe I should shut up. It's why we're really grateful to have you on here because, you know, we need we need this debate. Um, colleagues, we are getting towards the end. I'm going to hand over to uh, Jeremy Waits, uh, the Executive Director of, or Secretary General, sorry, of uh, the European Environmental Bureau to give some closing remarks. And then we will uh, wrap up for today. Uh, over to you, Jeremy. Well, thank you, Tim, and uh, thank you to everyone for this uh, this wonderful exchange. I think there's a lot for us to take away uh, from this as we move forward. And 
Uh, Tim, you, you referred to the uh, lively discussion in the chat, which was almost a euphemism. It was a raging discussion at some <laughs> moments. And, you know, it sort of makes me wonder how much we, we missed when we used to do that strange thing where you gathered in the same room and you sat around and you discussed. And now we have these other layers of conversation going on, some of them about three times as heated as the more civilized ones going on on the top level. Uh, so it's been a really great and interesting discussion. I, I mean, I would take as a starting point that it's important to recognize that mining is just one link in the chain of our current system of production and consumption. Uh, and that system is widely recognized to be unsustainable, which is why the European Green Deal calls for, quote, a set of deeply transformative policies and why the EEA's State of the Environment, most recent State of the Environment report, makes it clear that the transition that is needed is not just about adding some end of pipe solutions to reduce pollution, but it's about a fundamental rethink of, of the way we do things, whether it's food production, whether it's our use of energy, housing, uh, mobility, and so on. Um, and to start off to truly create a more sustainable Europe, uh, it's not only about achieving net zero and gr greenhouse gas emissions well before mid-century, I would say. It's not only about reversing biodiversity loss, tackling widespread pollution. Um, and as has been mentioned, we also need to achieve absolute reductions in the demand for and the consumption of raw materials, which of course will contribute to those other objectives. And you know, it was one of the disappointments in the otherwise very worthwhile Circular Economy Action Plan 2.0 uh, that it didn't include such targets. Um, and, and, and of course, the fact that it was the first act of one of the first acts of the Juncker Commission uh, to withdraw uh, an earlier proposal for such targets. I mean, that's hardly a sort of uh, proof that it, uh, it wasn't a good idea uh, when we think about the, the profile of that commission. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would say it's important to set binding EU and national material footprint reduction targets for 2030, 2040 and 2050 and mainstream those into all relevant uh, EU and national policies not only those dealing with the circular economy, but also industry, energy, climate, renewable energy, digitalization policies, and so on. Uh, and this will reduce the demand for virgin resources. Now, of course, targets on their own are nothing. I mean, targets are there to inform and shape other policies. Uh, and, you know, Peter, you've said that you're, you're not convinced by the importance of targets. I, I, I think that I heard you say that, but you also said, and I think I took this as a very positive sign that uh, we will do everything we can to ramp up the measures that will actually help us to reduce. I mean, I, I think, you know, we have to recognize that we're so far away from doing everything we can do uh, to take, with, in terms of the concrete policies, to uh, reduce demand, um, whether, whether you look at, uh, you know, green public procurement, recycling, due diligence or so, and so on. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole raft of policies that could be far more ambitious. And having a target, um, a resource reduction target, uh, will be a very clear pointer that all policies need to be aligned to deliver on that target. And it's a kind of a gap that we are recognizing when we're look at, looking at the comparison with, for example, greenhouse gas emission targets, uh, which also don't achieve anything. It's the policies, the concrete policies that are then introduced to deliver on those targets are the ones that really uh, make, make the difference. Um, yeah, I mean, just, you know, if I take the example of cars, which, you know, is a fairly topical issue today, uh, we're not going to achieve sustainability in, sustainability in transport by replacing every internal combustion engine vehicle with an electric one. Um, EU transport policy foresees 30 million electric, electric cars uh, by 2030, but fails to set a target for reducing the overall car fleet, um, the International Renewable Energy Agency mentioned that, quote, the largest reductions of life cycle emissions could be attained by changing patterns of vehicle use, uh, because a reduction of pri private vehicle use not only reduces the demand for materials, but also the energy use during the operation of vehicles. So what we're saying is we need to look at a much right, wider range of transport policies that substantially reduce the size of the vehicle fleet. For example, by making high quality public transport accessible to all through car sharing, promoting cycling, walking. Uh, and the ambition with which we pursue such measures will directly 
affect how much lithium, copper, aluminium, etc. we're looking for in Eurex. And, and let me emphasize, this is not to argue against electrification per se. We will need uh, to um, replace many internal combustion uh, engine cars with, uh, with electric vehicles. But just to put that in a broader context, to recognize its limitations and to recognize that electrification isn't a panacea. Um, in the chat, we heard, heard some people raising the issue of it being the responsibility of consumers to consume less, not mining companies. You could also say, well, it's not governments either. Uh, but of course, consumers uh, act within a certain framework. Do they have the right information in front of them through proper uh, labeling schemes that tell them about the, uh, the environmental uh, uh, qualities of the products they're buying and so on and so on. So, I mean, there's, a, there's I, I think this is a discussion that could go on lock, a, a, a lot longer, um, but since we're um, already past the half past, as far as I can see, I just want to thank everyone for their contribution and especially you, Tim, uh, for your very able uh, moderation of this event. And uh, I commend the report uh, to all of you. I hope the debate doesn't end uh, as we end this debate, uh, but that it will stimulate further consideration of all of these issues, uh, including the issue of the uh, resource reduction target. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand back to you, Tim, for the final closing remarks. Thank you. Th thanks, Jeremy. Thanks so much. And um, we're obviously just over time, so we'll, we'll, we'll leave it there. I think it's been you know, really clear. This is a very difficult area. It's full of trade-offs, trade-off between the low carbon transition and, and what that means in terms of uh, increased uh, extraction of uh, critical raw materials. Uh, these are these are difficult area to, to navigate. And uh, one thing I think that is clear is that we will need you know, many more opportunities for dialogue at this level, but also critically, as we heard from Katerina and from Sarah at the community level, dialogue, meaningful participation, better information sharing, uh, clearly going to be essential. So thanks a lot to the colleagues for the report today, and you know, which has certainly contributed in that spirit. And thanks to all of you um, uh, speakers that have joined us. Thank you, Peter. You know, if you felt under attack at certain moments, but it, you know, we really value you know having that that frank and robust exchange. And and finally, thank you very much to all of the participants. Over a hundred uh, people joining and um, and engaging in the topics today. And I'm sure there'll be much more to come from all of the institutions that were behind this report. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye-bye.